Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Brainwaves. Um, today on Brainwaves, we feature Dr. Tyrone Cannon, who is a professor of psychology at Yale University. And uh, he's for, uh, used to be um, Staglin Family Professor of Neuroscience at um, UCLA, where he directed the Center for the Assessment and Prevention of Prodromal States, which uh, was and still is a psychosis uh, prediction and prevention research uh, facility. Um, he's uh, now at Yale. He still directs the North American Prodrome Longitudinal Study, uh, which is also funded by Emerald, like CAPS, the Center for the Assessment and Prevention of Prodrome States was, and still is. Um, and he continues to do research in psychosis prediction and prevention. Uh, good morning, Ty. How are you? I'm doing great, Brandon. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have a few questions for you about your work in, in in particular, psychosis prediction and prevention. Um, shall we begin? Sure. Okay, great. And, and by the way, thank you for appearing on Brainwaves today. Oh, it's it's, it's my pleasure. pleasure. Okay, good. So, um, so psychosis prediction and prevention is clearly a key focus of your research, and I agree that it's an extremely important priority for uh, for research and also for development of, of care techniques today. Um, why is it so important in your view? Well, Brandon, I, I think prevention is is rather critical in the field of, of psychiatry overall, but, but in psychosis and schizophrenia-related disorders in, in particular, mainly because the treatments we have available for these disorders, although, you know, reasonably good at what they do, they're not cures. You know, they don't, they don't take away the underlying vulnerability to having uh, more episodes of those kinds of symptoms. And, and because they're not cures, that means we, uh, people generally have to stay on those medicines, you know, for, for, for long periods of time. Um, and, and that can be problematic when, for example, some of them, so, sometimes people have side effects that make it difficult for them to stay on them for, for those long periods. Um, and, and in general, they, they don't treat all aspects of the disorder. They, they, they're reasonably good at, at blunting the severity of, you know, the, the, the key symptoms like hallucinations and delusions, but they're not, they're not quite as good at, uh, at, at, uh, at helping with things like, uh, you know, uh, attentional problems, uh, cognitive problems, um, things like that. And so, uh, so, so the other the other reason to be interested in prevention is that <clears throat> disorders like schizophrenia, you know, they strike. They tend to strike um, uh, right at the time when a person is, you know, uh, finishing their education, uh, beginning to transition into an independent uh, status, and to pursue a career. And and if if uh, so often the onset of the disorder is so disruptive that it gets in the way of the young person completing these really important uh, states of, of, of education and, and, and that transition itself gets disrupted. And so we think with, with an orientation to prevention, um, more and more of the young people would not have to go through that very disruptive, uh, you know, this very disruptive experience right at this very critical time in, in development. Yeah, definitely. I can see why that's so important. Um, uh, I've been through psychosis myself and it came at a bad, you know, a disruptive time in my life. Uh, so I thank God you do what you do and I appreciate that. Um, so it, when you worked at, at CAPS, the Center for the Acceptance and Prevention of Prodromal States, and I'm not sure maybe you still do work in this clinical type of work now, Maybe yes. you can elaborate a bit. Pardon me. Yes. 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 I still have still have that. Okay. Um, when you would screen cl potential clients for um, possible admission into the the CAPS program, uh, you would ask them a series of questions that would um, hopefully um, let you know whether they're experiencing a number of warning signs for being in the prodrome for right. psychosis, meaning the kind of the the state of developing oncoming psychosis. Um, what were some of the warning signs you would look for? Well, it's it's uh, you know it, it's 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 a recent onset or or worsening of 
uh, some changes in perception and thinking and other aspects of behavior, including social relationships. Um, and, and often they're um, of the character that, uh, uh, so for example, in the perceptual domain, uh, the person may begin to feel or have the experience of hearing a voice call their name. And, and at that stage, at that stage, they understand that that probably happens in their own head. It's not some, it's not a real voice. It's not coming from outside of them. Um, but in the people who do progress to, to full psychosis, often that symptom becomes much, much more severe and, and becomes a, a voice that, that uh, you know, actually speaks to the patient and uh, speaks to the person and, and and says things in a derogatory way that, uh, you know, is often experiences very discomforting to, to the individual. Um, so it, it, it can be a precursor of more severe symptoms. It's not always, though, a precursor of more severe symptoms. Um, and that's, that's true of any one of these symptoms. They're, they're, they increase the likelihood that the person... May, may be in a programmal uh, risk state, but they don't guarantee that. And, and so it's really a constellation of things like the perceptual change, um, uh, you know, withdrawing from uh, social relationships and activities that, that were previously the person was very engaged with um, and having some, uh, you know, unusual beliefs about, uh, often about themes of, of uh, persecution or or um, malintent of others towards towards the individual. Okay. Ha having having ideas about that that go beyond the usual um, the usual sort of uh, you know give and give and take in in the adolescent world. It, it, it's it's more it's excessive compared to what, what is usual or typical of the adolescent world. So if you see a young person with um, an, an increase, a noticeable increase in symptoms like this, then they, they might be a potential candidate for, uh, for inclusion in your, your program. That's right. And, and so what, what they're in, what's true about, the, about that is that they're at higher risk for developing not just psychosis, but a range of, a range of possible uh, of, that, of those symptoms getting worse and, and resulting in a range of possible outcomes. And, and so, um, but at this stage, only about 35% of, of people who, who have that constellation do progress to a fully psychotic uh, state, uh, at least within, say, a two-year period, which is the time period that most of these clinical programs tend to monitor people. And... Um, uh, the other, the other 65 percent, among the other 65 percent, there's quite a quite a large number, maybe half of the remainder, that, that actually get better uh, with um, you know the interventions that are offered uh, in, in the early phase, um, uh, and uh, another uh, the other half who tend to have those kinds of symptoms, but more or less stably. Okay. Yeah. Um, did did the light just go off where you are? Uh, yeah, that was that was another computer screen that just went blank. I'll, I'll turn it back on if that helps with the lighting. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Yeah, I can see you much better. Thank you. Good. So, um, well, so since you say that a, a, a large proportion of, of people who experience these um, potentially worrisome symptoms um, as a as a young person uh, do get better. Um, at your facilities, you're trying to find biomarkers, so more more accurate biological means of predicting whether somebody might actually convert to psychosis if not given an intervention. That's and right. uh, you you found some pretty good results, uh, some pretty encouraging results, um, in in looking at things like uh, decreasing density of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex or white matter, which is like the functionally connective tissue between parts of the brain uh, developing differently in people who are, have oncoming psychosis uh, right. and such, and, and even some emotional and, and cognitive, uh, social, social cognitive uh, correlations there with the imaging results that you've done. Um, so can, can you please explain a bit about these biomarker type results that you found and how might they be helpful in predicting oncoming psychosis? Sure. Um, well, as you as you just summarized, Brandon, the, the, the key finding that, that we've 
uh, had over the over the past few years in the Naples study is that is that the young people who do progress to full psychotic symptoms they show a, a steeper rate of loss of tissue of brain tissue in, in this part of the brain the prefrontal cortex that you alluded to that is so critical for inter integration of, of thinking and perception and emotion um, it's a very uh, important brain area because it plays a role in so many of these different functions and really it's it's a key center in the coordination of them and and so um, while it's normal to lose some tissue during this period of, uh, say, from the late teens to the early 20s, it's, it's normal. The brain actually has a normal process of reducing some of the connections that are there as a part of its fine-tuning. Uh, it's a fine-tuning process. Um, in, in people who develop psychosis, the, the, the rate of loss is much, much um, enhanced or, or increased and uh, and that that results in probably the individuals crossing some critical threshold where the amount of connectivity between cells in the brain is 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 no longer capable of sustaining this integration function, uh, or at least not to the same degree. And and so that's the the so as you pointed out, we we we've we've characterized this finding as a, a biomarker. Really, it's a biomarker of, of conversion to psychosis from, a, from an at-risk state. And, and it's, it can be assessed only by, by uh, uh, doing an MRI scan of the brain on two occasions, you know, at, at a baseline assessment in which the person is ascertained to be in this risk syndrome state. And then um, at some time later, uh, when uh, some change may have already occurred. So... So we, we have to have two of them in order to ascertain the slope or the trajectory of change in gray matter over time. That, um, we're, we're obviously still working on this, on this as, a, uh, as, a, as an indicator that might ultimately be useful in you know, standard clinical settings. Right now, it's very much a research finding and not, not used in, in clinical settings. But eventually, it may, it may attain that uh, amount of usefulness. Okay. Uh, well, that, that sounds pretty hopeful. Um, so, uh, I, I was going to ask uh, if you use any of these procedures in clinical settings, but it seems like it's, you focus mainly on the, the warning signs that, that, that you had told me about before. For yeah, and, and that's, that's pretty characteristic of the field of, of psychiatry currently, is that mm -hmm. The, our ability to diagnose these disorders and, and to find people at risk is still largely dependent on uh, clinical features, inter things that you would you would pick up by interviewing the individual or their or their relatives. Um, sometimes there are other contextual factors like having a first degree relative who has schizophrenia or a related disorder. The presence of those other risk factors do play a role. But, uh, but, but but for the most part, what we're talking about are um, criteria that you can only uh, figure out if the person meets by talking to them and, and, and asking them questions about these changes. Okay. So if you do identify a young person who may be at risk for developing psychosis using these criteria, then how, how do you intervene? What, what are the, and what are the most effective ways you found to intervene to, to prevent psychosis? Yeah. Well, we've been very interested in that question because although we've improved the ability to predict who, who, who will develop psychosis, you know, if, if all you had is the ability to predict something without being able to offer the person something that might help them, um, uh, then, then that, would fall, that would fall flat. And, and, and so we've been interested in, in a number of trying a number of different approaches. The, the, the broader um, field has, there, there have been about seven or eight published randomized controlled clinical trials. And, and basically the um, overall finding, if you were to summarize the field overall, is that any, any specific intervention is useful. Any specific, people who've gotten any specific intervention have generally done better, whether that is a biological intervention or a psychological intervention. Um, but when you look at the specific studies, 
the ones that have used, for example, antipsychotic drugs have not tended to find that antipsychotic drugs prevent psychosis. They, they dampen the severity of the symptoms that put the person at risk. But once they go off those drugs, the, the rate of, of uh, conversion to psychosis uh, comes back to the same level as it is in the, in the placebo group. So, so it, it's not like they prevent psychosis um, it, by, in terms of having, you know, being on them for a brief period. Uh, you, you might be able to prevent a, a progression if you stayed on them forever, but, you know, 65% of the people wouldn't have developed psychosis anyway, so that's really not a, that's really not a, a workable approach. Um, so, so antipsychotic drugs probably are not the treatment of choice, um, there's there's one study that has shown that uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation is useful. Um, it's a curious study. It, it, it you know it's <laughs> uh, it, essentially it's fish oil, um, and it's yeah. it's it needs to be replicated before we take it you know too seriously. But there are now a, a couple of other efforts, including one in, in the Naples consortium, to to see whether that that effect can be replicated. And then, but I would say I put a lot more stock these at, at our current at our current level of understanding in the psychological interventions, and um, and and I'll tell you about a couple of those. So, so one of them is is a very family based intervention that really um, ha it has three kind of three key ingredients. One is psychoeducation, so it, informing the young person who's having the changes in some, in, in behavior as well as the, the parent, usually the parents, but sometimes also the sibling, about um, you know, mental illness, about, about the early warning signs, about the biological underpinnings of these disorders. So education. Then there's a stage of family problem solving. So learning skills that are actually of skills development, and that's the second stage, learning communication skills that allow the family to discuss the emerging behavioral issues in the, in the young person and to have the young person participate fully in those discussions in ways that lead to constructive outcomes. And then the third, the third phase is problem solving, so where, where the family selects, focus on issues like the, person, the young person's you know, decreased motivation to do things like go to school or, or or have relationships, and solves around that and develops, you know, new strategies and new approaches. And so we, we found that that intervention actually, um, a, a, an intervention that focuses on those three features does significantly better than an intervention that just focuses on psychoeducation uh, in, in actually getting the families to, to communicate with each other better and to be more effective at solving on these issues. And we think it also um, uh, results in more symptom improvement in the in the young people. Um, although we're not completely, we, we haven't yet done the test that will tell us whether it it's associated with a lower rate of conversion to full psychosis. We don't we don't know that yet. Um, there, there's also uh, there's also an approach to psychological uh, treatment called cognitive behavior therapy. Mm. That doesn't involve the family, but does involve the young person, and that that approach really, it, it's it's sort of a psychological treatment. It it's designed to, to help the young person start to hone in on their own thought processes. So, you know, let's say they're sitting in a, in a coffee shop and they start to have the feeling that other people are looking at them and maybe having bad thoughts about them. Mm -hmm. The cognitive behavior therapy would help the young person question that assumption that whatever they whatever it is they did notice about the other people, whether they looked at them or or, or looked at them with a with a an odd look on their face, whether that actually means or whether that's actually evidence that they're thinking about them. After all, they they probably don't know the person, and it may. Have, but but it's this kind of, it's this kind of work of of uh, uh, ask, getting, getting the, the young person to focus in on their own thinking and how they make these automatic assumptions and question them more and become more 
empirical about um, about what's the evidence that this is really true, and uh, and that seems to be helpful in in reducing uh, the, the the level of these symptoms and so forth. Great. Uh, I know that cognitive behavioral therapy is, is very effective for, for patients who already have psych psychosis or other mental illnesses. So, and it's because it doesn't involve um, uh, pharmaceuticals, it seems like it'd be a lot less an invasive uh, an intervention for someone who's just simply at risk. And it could probably help anybody, even if they don't have a mental illness, just to understand how they think better and manage it better. So, um, uh, it, I, 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 I'm, so I. I Agree. It's, it's essentially just training and life skills, you know, how, how to be clear about making inferences and so forth. So I, I agree with everything you just said. Yeah. I also agree that, that family involvement is really important in, in making sure a young person is, it remains mentally healthy. I mean, families are people who love you the most and, and, and vice versa. And, and, you know, they're an essential part of a young person's life. And so, uh, I, that what you say totally makes sense about involving the family and, and make, making sure they're a good support system for the young person. Yep. Yeah. So, um, do you have anything from your experience you'd like to, you know, any fur, any further you'd like to say to families or individuals who've experienced psychosis in themselves? Um, and uh, tips for maybe a living healthier or anything like that? Absolutely. I, I think that in my mind, the key thing is to stay engaged in, in your life, right? It's, I mean, psychosis might happen, you know, it might happen. And if it, if it does, it's going to be scary for sure, but you're going to come out of that, and, you know, and, and you're going to be, you're not always going to be that way. And, and, and the, the key thing is to continue to have goals. And even if you feel like you need to modify your goals, uh, you know, to, to, to avoid being overstressed and things like that. Um, it's still important to have the goals and to, and to set, set your life up in the way that you always had originally intended. And so, um, and, and to stay engaged with other people and with projects and moving forward. I think that's the key thing because the biggest risk is, is to be defeated by it. And, and I think that's, that's no longer, you know, the medicines are reasonably good at getting rid of the acute symptoms, but, but then there's, there's, you know, there's the need to stay engaged in your life. And for me, that engagement and then educating oneself about the, about the illness and about things that one can do, taking more of, a, of, a, of an active role in, in, in solving the issues. Uh, and, and I think the family can be important. And they need to have that same orientation, but the young person too needs to have that orientation. And I, I would I would say that actually if if that's your approach, you know, you you have a really good likelihood of a of a, of a very and 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 those those characteristics are very predictive of you know better outcomes among people who have who have these disorders. Excellent. Okay. Th thanks for uh, sharing that. Yeah, that sounds like really good advice. Um, so, Ty, uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time to appear on Brainwaves today. And um, uh, starting uh, soon, there will be people posting questions um, after I post this video online. And sure. uh, are you ready to answer some questions when they do? Happy to do that. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you, Ty. Uh, hope you have a great day, and I'll, I'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good, Brandon. Take care, then. You too. Bye-bye. Okay.